All right, so how to study production clouds with, uh, which can be proprietary infrastructure. We started by we started by examining what modern serverless clouds are today, and the first important observation we made when just started working with serverless clouds is that uh, different providers have the same fundamental serverless cloud architecture, with any of these clouds featuring the same three fundamental components, uh, foundational components across um, any cloud. The first one is called this cluster scheduler that is on the way of all incoming invocations, selecting or spawning uh, new instances of functions on demand. Um, then there is a fleet of worker nodes where function instances can run. But, to sp um, but if there is no idle function instance, uh, the infrastructure needs to spawn a new one. In this case, um, first, um, the infrastructure has to move function initialization state from storage to the selected worker node, selected by the scheduler, to start a new function instance. So the storage is the third important component, and this is the same storage service which is used for communication between uh, different functions. So uh, because the uh, functions are stateless and cannot hold or share state. To reason about the performance of this entire um, cloud, we needed a way uh, to benchmark different com foundational components. And this is what Stellar was designed for. Um, Stellar allows to configure function characteristics and traffic shape um, to stress any of these components and understand how the performance of uh, um, any of these components in one cloud compares to the performance of the corresponding components in another, in another cloud. This allows to compare different clouds and make um, definitive uh, um, conclusions about which component is a fundamental bottleneck and which one just needs another uh, round of optimizations. So we started three clouds and we found the following um, common characteristics. And uh, Stellar is open source. You can try to use it as well. You could try it out for yourself. So let me uh, give an overview of what we found uh, with Stellar, which is a published work in uh, IISWC last year. So we evaluated the response time of warm and cold functions by steering invocations to these functions once at a time with different interarrival time. Invoking functions frequently, for example, once per second, guarantees that these functions uh, would have at least one warm instance at a time, at that time, whereas invoking um, functions rarely, for example, once in half an hour, uh, would guarantee or almost guarantee that there will be no instance with a high probability. Um, when the invocation actually reaches uh, the cloud. So the instance has to be spawned first. This chart show um, CDFs on the y-axis, cumulative distribution functions of um, the response time, which is on the x-axis in milliseconds. Uh, so you can see that the cold invocations take way more time, like an order of magnitude more time than warm invocations, which is something that is expected. However, you can see that um, however, you can see that both of them are pr quite predictable uh, in a sense that uh, tail latency in both cases is not so big as compared to, to the median. Then we uh, benchmark the storage component. Uh, by deploying two functions uh, in the producer-consumer scenario, which communicate only um, by storage. In particular, particularly AWS S3 and uh, uh, in this uh, example, and the Google Cloud Storage. Um, so 
uh, one in this setup, a fun one function, the producer function transmits a payload of a configurable size to the second function. And since these functions are stateless, um, the data is transmitted um, through storage, as I said. Uh, so the first function first saves uh, the data to the storage, and the second one then reads it from the storage. Uh, we capture this latency using internal timestamps, uh, which we instrument which is instrumentation of the code uh, from the user side. Um, so what we see in the results is that on the left, we plot the latency on, on the y-axis as a function of transfer size on the x-axis. So you can see there is a big difference between the median, the latencies uh, plotted as solid lines and tail latencies plotted in dashed lines for both of these providers. It's more than an order of magnitude difference. And on the uh, right chart, you can see uh, the CDFs for one megabyte and one gigabyte transfers. Uh, so you can see that the, uh, this uh, storage was never optimized for small transfers, like one megabyte or lower. So that um, uh, small transfers uh, cause a huge um, increase of the tail latency. And this brings us to the conclusion that the storage-based transfers are actually one of the key tail latency sources calling for optimization. Then there is um, the scheduler uh, component to be benchmarked as well. So for that, uh, we studied the response time of warm functions in the presence of bursty traffic with long execution time, uh, one second. Um, for serverless, it's long to assess the queuing effects across concurrent invocations of the same function. So we find that the choice of the scheduling policy here uh, is, uh, has a dramatic effect um, on the function response time. So in this chart, we plot um, two, ty two types of uh, um, lines. So first type is the solid this stands for a single invocation at a time while dashed uh, stays for the burst in, uh, for the burst invocation when of 100 requests at a time so you can see that with this simple trace of uh, one or 100 requests uh, in a burst the behavior of uh, different providers is completely different aws has uh, very little sensitivity meaning that actually aws spawns um, an instance for every concurrent invocation that it um, receives, while other providers, in particular Azure, they try to uh, rely, to try to buffer incoming requests and steer them to the same function instance, uh, trying to minimize the effect of the cold start um, on the response time, and also it allows them to save cost. But this uh, creates orders of mind to swallow response, responses. Uh, and Google is somewhere in the middle with uh, quite a lot of queuing exposed as well. So we see that clearly the scheduling uh, policies, uh, they have a big impact and there is a lot of improvement uh, to be done. So to briefly summarize what we know about the state of today's cloud is that uh, call starts are still a big problem despite all the innovation. The communication is slow and there are orders of magnitude difference in both of these bottlenecks. And scheduling is even like, it's a bit harder to quantify, but clearly even the simple um, cases like uh, I showed you before uh, can, this not only destroy the tail latency, but even uh, destroy the mean latency and median. And there are more information in the paper that you can find. So clearly there is a lot to improve in serverless. So we are to publish a lot of papers. That's great. So how do we do this? So we embarked on a journey to find the right tools for serverless researchers and first, we looked at the production systems with their complicated distributed stack uh, with a lot of distributed components. 
um, which is mostly proprietary, it's making it impractical to use in academic setup. On the other side, um, academics uh, rely on incomplete or non-representative system, systems. For example, systems that um, may include only one or several components and uh, limit their optimizations to these components. For example, there is a lot of work on hypervisors for serverless, but uh, not many papers actually consider the full stack in their evaluation. Another example of uh, uh, an example of in, an incomplete uh, and non-representative system is uh, many of the academic uh, systems uh, use containers, while in production, all the leaders uh, of the cloud market today rely on um, lightweight virtualization instead of um, uh, containers. So what we noticed is uh, what was missing is a complete open source framework for serverless researchers in academia. So what, uh, the good news is that there are a lot of open source technologies uh, out there uh, released by different providers. So uh, we adopted uh, Kubernetes as uh, the cluster scheduler and Knative, which runs on top of Kubernetes as a function as a service API, allowing to deploy functions uh, written by users using Docker containers, uh, Docker images. And um, um, we adopted uh, several uh, isolation technologies, uh, one from Amazon called Firecracker Hypervisor and one from Google, Gvisor Hypervisor. And obviously we support containers as well. The lifetime of uh, uh, function instances is controlled uh, with container D. Uh, and um, we chose gRPC as a communication fabric for both the control plane and data plane as a high performance fabric uh, backed by Google. The Beehive framework fills the gap uh, by satisfying all needs of serverless researchers um, in systems. It contains a representative, uh, it is representative of serverless clouds uh, in the commercial area like Azure and Amazon, Lambda, and so on. It contains only open source components at the same time. Um, and uh, finally, it comes with a set of various tools for performance analysis, uh, workloads, and Gen5 simulation images, enabling uh, research across the whole stack. So, a brief overview of Beehive architecture. Um, it includes the clients that drive the load and the latency measurements, um, injecting invocations into the system. Uh, the cluster infrastructure includes um, function as a service, um, for uh, native, implement, uh, native function as a service framework, uh, which supports Docker images deployment and uh, also drives auto scaling by monitoring the load and uh, reacting to it. It runs on top of Kubernetes and it's actually developed by the same um, by Google uh, as well as uh, Kubernetes. And um, now both of them are part of CNCF. The worker nodes uh, run a component called MicroVIA Manager, which supports different uh, runtimes. Uh, different micro VMs driving uh, uh, control requests uh, coming from Kubernetes uh, to container D. According to the runtime, they uh, uh, drive like a type of micro VM. And it also acts as a software switch by forwarding the invocations through gRPC planes to the function instances. Finally, it is also first to support snapshots uh, at scale of many nodes uh, when it runs Firecracker in particular. In particular. Um, to program with Kinetic functions, um, uh, you just need to know a couple of things. It's, it's really simple. To deploy a function, you need to provide an image, like a Docker image, uh, with an HTTP server, um, and 
uh, a function that is triggered upon a, a gRPC or a HTTP um, event com coming or packet. Um, to deploy a function, I need the following. I need to write the following YAM file, and this, it is as simple as you can see, uh, in which um, the API version stands for um, Knative Serving. It's basically a type. Um, it is also a service as we described from the perspective of uh, Kubernetes. Um, the metadata points are not so important. It's basically the name of the function and the namespace that these uh, functions are deployed with. This is uh, purely for uh, isolation. And uh, the only thing you need to uh, specify here is uh, the Docker image uh, pass, for example, on docker.io hub. Um, and finally, if you use um, gRPC, because uh, in, uh, in VHive we use gRPC throughout, as a single protocol throughout, uh, you need to specify that this is HTTP, HTTP v2. And this is why we have this mapping of H2C uh, type. And uh, you also need to specify the port on which the gRPC or the HTTP server uh, listens to. So how does autoscaling works? All requests come into the Ingress uh, load balancer, which is in our case Istio, um, which then forwards the invocation to the activator, which acts as a, as a centralized queue for all the functions of all the function instances. And then um, it buffers RPCs until, well, this uh, invocations, RPCs, until they can be consumed by instances uh, so when uh, enough uh, function instances are spawned to serve uh, the traffic. Um, but first, the invocations, um, but before invocations can reach the function instance, they go to a queue proxy component, which is a container which runs in the same port as the function instance itself and um, intercepts all uh, RPCs coming to that function instance. The reason why it does so is to buffer this request so that they can be executed one by one, which is important for the from the security perspective. And another reason for that is it needs to, uh, its first and foremost job is to monitor the load in front of this function instance and to report if the function instance is idle or it's busy. And this report goes through the autoscaler component, which then uh, can send request to Kubernetes uh, to spawn new function instances on demand in case the traffic um, goes up. Um, another component is uh, called Istio. It's a very generic component and uh, this is quite a complicated scheme. So um, what you can see is it's a distributed uh, mesh architecture um, uh, load balancer, uh, which supports both uh, north, south, and uh, west, east traffic coming from both the ingress gateway, like uh, API gateway in uh, AWS Lambda, uh, which then goes to the pods of services. In our case, these are function instances. Uh, but it goes through, obviously, the um, activator and autoscaler components, just like I described before. Yeah, I just want to, uh, um, so there are two ways of uh, deploying this component. So one is uh, as an ingress and one is a distributed mesh where uh, invoice, which are containers part of this uh, ingress, uh, of this uh, distributed load balancer are deployed in each of the pods. The default configuration is uh, the simple one where this ingress is just a scalable front end, sharing nothing. And we also disable TOS, but you can hack through the uh, YAML files and um, um, change it. Um, another um, 
way of uh, using serverless is actually making it asynchronous, which means which is also called uh, sometimes event-based. So in the event-based, uh, like in any event-based system, uh, there is a publish and subscribe actions where uh, subscribers subscribe for particular to receive particular events from sources of these events. Um, in a sense of uh, in the context of serverless applications, both the sources and subscribers uh, for the events, which are invocations, are serverless functions. But um, the architecture supports these events and subscribers to be any of those. Uh, it could be a conventional service. It could be a function. Uh, so that's why uh, I show Knative serving because this is the same Knative serving as I described just now um, on the top and the normal service, conventional service at the bottom. The way this uh, pops up system works is that all events go through a broker, which uh, for example, can be Apache Kafka and Apache Kafka is supported, um, which is a, an event queue um, that um, maintains the order um, and does uh, the rest of the functionality of uh, uh, an event queue or a persistent queue. can also be replicated and so on. So this is the event-based uh, serverless. And uh, um, it's also support. So let's talk about the tools. So we already talked uh, about the vSwarm. So it's a team effort with DH, uh, Stanford and the broad systems community with a lot of functions already being contributed in different uh, languages and um, um, comprising uh, different uh, complex applications and integrating with uh, various uh, conventional cloud services such as uh, storage, caching, event queues and so on. Um, and the workloads come with distributed tracing and um, um, hardware analysis tools such as Intel Top Down and uh, Gen 5 Simulator as well. So about all of these tools, you're gonna uh, have time to um, you can you will have time to explore all of them in the hands-on sessions which are coming after this talk. So, but let me give a brief overview of those. So what is distributed tracing and why it's necessary? The serverless systems are complex and uh, because uh, their stacks are um, deep and scattered across the big system. So what VHive does, it combines the provider and the user side in a single trace with components on the left and uh, um, the timeline um, they, they delay breakdown on the right. So it's easy to see where's the elephant on the in the room. So I believe there is a question. Okay, so there's a question um, about the previous part, but I think I'll take it uh, now. Um, I had a question about the highly modular control plane with multiple components um, you showed. Does the control plane aim to be an approximation of the control plane of an actual cloud provider? So um, all of these components are part of uh, Google and Amazon stack. So all of them, even taken from different infrastructures, they are considered to be representative. And we talk uh, regularly to the providers uh, to make sure that whatever we include in the VHive ecosystem, um, it does it, it does resonate with their vision of how serverless system should operate. So yes. Um, and another and another um, tool is um, uh, based on Intel top down. Uh, which is a method for CPU microarchitecture profiling. So a typical worker node in serverless may run hundreds and thousands of functions 
and all of the CPU resources have to be uh, multiplexed among them. Obviously, this is not what uh, uh, people designed processors for before serverless. The serverless is ramping up just now. Um, the good news is that Intel developed uh, a methodology called uh, top-down, which allows to plot this uh, nice diagrams plotting the number, for example, um, uh, plotting the overheads on the y-axis and um, the number of functions uh, um, deployed on the worker um, on the x-axis. So in this case, uh, we run this experiment uh, for 16 uh, configurations with two to 32 uh, function instances working at the same time. And uh, what the tool gives you is the fraction of CPU cycles that goes into one of the uh, microarchitectural uh, bottleneck buckets. So in this case, you can see that on this platform, um, the CPU becomes uh, memory bound, like the dark blue, as uh, we add more um, uh, function is running on this platform. So it's very convenient to see uh, uh, different effects. Uh, for example, this multi-tendency uh, implications on the microarchitectural um, state of the CPU. So you learn about many of this in the next section. And another one I wanted to mention is that um, we also uh, we are working on adding support uh, uh, for Swarm in Gem5 simulator. So we are going to release it soon. Uh, and in this release, um, you can actually deploy an arbitrary function uh, packaged in the Docker container uh, and invoke it. And we will have a session uh, in like the last session will be about that. Um, and this will be possible to do in Gem5 simulator which would run client in the emulation node and function instance uh, in the cycle accurate mode, which uh, would provide exact statistics of on um, uh, simulated hardware. So what you can do is pretty much anything uh, which is uh, within the scope of ASPOS. You can do research in the brain systems, in networks or in the architecture. Um, and uh, as a showcase for, for those, we have uh, published and submitted papers all across um, this list. So a few words about the community. Beehive is a community effort with a lot of academic contributors uh, with top universities uh, contributing their code, workloads, and uh, um, so on. And it also has a number of industrial collaborators um, who either use VHive or contribute to VHive regularly. Um, and we are gr grateful for them to, to give feedback to us from time to time. So as of now, VHive has established itself in the open source community with um, a lot of stars and forks uh, already. So I encourage everyone to join this effort. And Beehive today has already quite a big team of uh, maintainers and supporters and uh, alumni as well. Um, and this is not, this is far not a uh, complete list of people who contributed. So what I would like to leave you with uh, after this talk is that serverless poses many challenges for today's cloud infrastructure. Um, and there are a lot of bottlenecks that we can improve. This, however, requires thinking out of the box and uh, innovating throughout the system. But with the VHive framework, you can see the complete uh, picture. You have a complete view uh, from the end-to-end -end perspective and down to per component perspective. So you can actually focus your search um, quite easily and study the workloads we provide and use the tools we provide. So please join the Beehive community and contribute new components uh, and uh, 
tools and anything you think would be useful for us to make uh, serverless systems better. So with this, I will conclude my talk and uh, maybe take one question. Uh, yes, there's a question. Can, yeah, you, can you come up to the microphone so the online people can hear you? Uh, <laughs> so like, uh, I'm, I'm Cleo from Huawei Zurich. I just want to ask if I, if I understood correctly, like that uh, we have uh, uses different uh, parts of a real, let's say application, a real cloud servers and so on, like Kubernetes, Kubernetes and stuff. So do, do you, I uh, mean, is it possible for we have to be obsolete, let's say very, you know, quickly, or is it possible uh, at all to be obsolete, let's say, with respect to the modern stuff that we're using? That's my question. Are you talking if uh, the performance is representative of a modern cloud? Yeah. Yeah, it is. So we know there, there, are, uh, there are issues, uh, for example, with Scheduler, uh, because Kubernetes Scheduler, um, most clouds, they actually build their own Scheduler solutions uh, tailored for uh, serverless, uh, for, for their serverless offering. So right now, this stack has limitations, uh, which decreases increases the cold start time. But when it comes to... Uh, implications of running workloads like uh, multi-tenancy, um, network performance, and so on. This is very representative. This basically the same uh, protocols, uh, the same fundamental protocols that run in serverless clouds. For example, um, everywhere is control a data plane is HTTP based. This is exactly what they use. Um, these are micro VMs, uh, virtualization solutions. This uh, exactly what Amazon uses uh, in their uh, serverless offering. Gvisor is exactly what uh, Google uses for their offering and so on. And it will keep improving, obviously. Okay, so I have also one question. Uh, because you said that we have our mobile is different that you have uh, micro VMs instead of containers. So will it be just easier to add support for micro VMs there instead of your VMs? <laughs> Completely new stack. Did you hear the question? Or Can you I... repeat, please? Yeah. yeah. So the question was, um, since it's based on uh, other open source, uh, if, if it wouldn't be easier to just implement uh, VMs there instead of containers, instead of building this uh, VHive, right? So what, what does it mean build VMs in this case? So why not add VMs into the original upstream open source instead of building an own thing on top of it? Well, that's a great question, I would say. Uh, I the thing is uh, to contribute uh, to a big platform like uh, Kubernetes or uh, something like this, you need to have company wide resources. So, uh, and this is not what we are looking at right now. We need a platform to be flexible and agile enough to innovate quickly. We're not interested in uh, spending a lot of hours to to write production grade code for what what uh, companies decide not to open source, right? So it's just different goals. What's important is uh, for experiments to be represented, right? Do you want to? Okay. Is there a follow up question? Just one second. No, I just I just thought that because like if you had that support for micro VMs. Uh, to open this, for example, not to build your own VM, just to add support for Firecracker or Gvisor or whatever else you want, instead of creating, like, why don't you, why didn't you use other part? Yeah, yeah, that's, it's, a good, yeah. it's a very good question. So why, for example, so first of all, OpenWhisk uh, is 
is a system that is um, separate from this whole open source initiative uh, driven by Cloud Native Foundation, by CNCF. And it uses a lot of in-house components that are specific for um, OpenWhisk particularly. And the problem is that OpenWhisk is used only by IBM uh, with a tiny fraction. What we did, we actually took technologies that are used by biggest providers like Amazon and Google and integrated them without writing much of our own code. We took their code and integrated it. So uh, this is much more representative than OpenWhisk uh, and it would take less time to, uh, to bring all these technologies to a Kubernetes-based platform rather than bringing these technologies uh, into a platform which is uh, um, quite different and distinct from standard Kubernetes-based platforms. All right, thank you. Thank you. So I think uh, we would be open for questions offline, but uh, this time I'll um, uh, hand the mic to uh, Tom. <laughs>